I'm Jean Sarpong and I'm the author of Diversify. I was disabled for four years of my life. When I was a teenager, I was hit by a car. I didn't walk for two years and then I had to wear a, a neck brace for another two. The thing that was just so strange about it for me was the way people reacted towards me after the accident. The way people treated me, it was, I almost saw a kind of dumbing down. It was the most bizarre thing. And I think that experience is what has made me so passionate about this issue because I wasn't any different as a person, but the world certainly reacted to me in that way. There's a quote from George Bush, not somebody I quote often. And this quote was in relation to um, African-American kids in the inner cities. But what he spoke about was the soft bigotry of low expectations. And that really applies to our disabled community. We've looked at gender, we've looked at BAME, we're now looking at disability. Could you imagine having 500 Cheryl Sandbergs mm. leaning in for disability and with disability? We would get this done. Yeah. If we want disability to be meaningfully at the business table, we need the leaders. It's got to be the leaders. The uncomfortable truth is they don't exist. I believe, and many do, that the diversity and inclusion agenda is very difficult for business when we're pitting humanity against each other. This year we'll do gender. Next we'll year do race. we'll do race. <laughs> Next year we'll do LGBTQ. What are we talking yeah. about? A la carte and pick and mix inclusion? Are you kidding me? Mm. Since when did we think it was okay to have a hierarchy of exclusion or inclusion? My name's Erin Boyce. I work at Alliance Learning and I'm a business administrator, currently an apprentice. I'm registered blind. I have a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. Actually, I moved out of my parents' house about a week after I left college. I really felt determined to get out and start living this new chapter of my life. So that was in the July that I'd left and I, I moved out. I felt my prospects were pretty positive about getting a job. Um, and then I was applying to things and I wasn't getting anything at all. Um, and at this point, I was still putting my visual impairment on my CV. I felt like it was all framed in a positive way um, and it shouldn't have put them off, but I didn't get any kind of response at all. And then in October, I decided to take that off my CV and I got two interviews that month and I didn't put it on again. I went to 18 interviews and for most people, that's the give up point. And I, I didn't because I really still wanted to work. So I kept going for it, but I know a lot of people who have given up. And those are people that are perfectly able to work. And if you reached out to them, and you said, hey, we know this employer is accepting. We know that they are willing to make adaptations. Maybe you should apply to them. So you're going to get high quality applicants. Because actually, I know in the case of, of visually impaired people in general, there is a, actually a higher rate of them going to university than the general public because they know that their chances of getting a job are much worse. So they go into higher education more often. I really do think it is a massive opportunity for employers um, and it's it's something being on the inside now you know having this opportunity to hopefully make a difference if I can having had my personal experience I'm trying now to actually get us to tap into that because I think there are just there's this massive amount of high quality applicants out there you know and they're more resilient they're more loyal when you've slogged through all these interviews and you've had all these things said to you and you feel like utter garbage and then somebody treats you like you're not a burden for once and they're willing to make all these adaptations for you, you know what you've got at that point. So Alan, here we have the statistics relating to disability and employment in Britain. That's right. Probably and bleaker than any of the other data we've looked at. Well, it depends how you look at it. Okay. I mean, one thing I could say is we could we could start with a good news story. Please. Here, which is that if you look at from when the figures that we've got that we can go back as far as 2013, mm -hmm. there's a consistent trend in mm. the employment oh, rate yeah. of so disabled people. Consistent increase, yeah. Both for men and for women. And in fact, uh, the employment rate of uh, women with disabilities you can see it's actually accelerated a yeah. little bit faster than yeah. the, um, the employment rate for, the, for men with disability. Yeah. And crucially, has crossed this 50% line yes. for the first, for the first, the first time. time. So the employment rate overall for both men and women is now over 
50%. But just over 50%. Just over 50%. And so... And we would not be celebrating that for any other group. Exactly. So in fact, that's exactly where this, this term, the disability employment gap, mm -hmm. pops up. Mm -hmm. Because if that line now looks slightly less impressive, that's the same data we've just been looking at. Yeah starting at zero and finishing at 100 so this is the entire scale of the chart and you yeah. can see that it's a very modest improvement yep. but i mean the real putting those numbers into context really only happens when you put the um, employment rate for people without disability yeah. on top yeah. okay and so yeah. you can see that there really is this yeah this thing and and this is what we're calling the disability employment gap yeah um, and if you look at how those figures have changed since 2013 um, there's been a modest narrowing of the gap. It was 33.1 percentage points back mm -hmm. in 2013. It's now down to 28.9 percent. My name is Gemma Louise Stevenson and I am a freelance reporter for Sky Sports. Alongside my reporting, I'm also an athlete. I don't like to stop. <laughs> I'm quite busy. I just want to live life to the full and I want to make the most of life. So Gemma, here we are at Sky, uh, your place of work. Uh, my place of work sometimes too, actually. <laughs> I'm going to ask you what sounds like a very dumb question. But for employers, how do they advertise to disabled people? So what is that? What, what is the thing that they need to do to make it very clear that this is who they're targeting? I mean, I think for me, it's all very well having these training schemes. Like, I, I went through a training scheme myself. However, it was a very negative experience because the whole atmosphere wasn't inclusive originally to start with. Okay. I think they're a good idea, but I'm also very cynical of them because you can have all these great, you know, inclusive, training schemes to get people into the workplace to show them what it's like to give them experience so that they can then go in a job but the workplace to start with is not an inclusive workplace you're not going to retain those staff one thing i find about sky is they're very inclusive they treat me as an individual i'm seen as a reporter first before a wheelchair user who happens to be a reporter which is so important yeah whether you're a reporter like myself or whether you're working in HR or an administration, you are working in HR, you are working in administration, you're working in media before your disability. I use the social model of disability, which is the favoured version amongst the disabled community. So it's not saying that my illness makes me disabled, it's the um, environment around me that not makes, being accessible yeah. makes me disabled. What's your message to employers and particularly HR directors in terms of what they can do when they are creating an application and also making sure that that application reaches people with disabilities? And then secondly, once they do hire people with disabilities, make sure that they're able to thrive within their companies. I think my biggest point would be treat everybody as an individual. Ah, one thing. So, oh, no, 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 no. This is powerful. Yeah. So it's not about treating everybody equally as such. It's treating everybody as an individual, understanding that we all have individual needs. Yeah, because we all have different wow. needs to be equal. To achieve equality is really based on treating everybody as an individual. Yeah. It's very much talk to the person because yeah. we as disabled people are very good at communicating. Because you have to be. We have to. Yeah. And do you know what? We know it's not going to be perfect. You know, we know it's never, we're not striving for perfection, we're just striving for a way to work that enables us to work. Exactly. Yeah. And things will go wrong. Even in the most inclusive environments, yeah. things will go wrong. But you know what makes the difference between an employer I want to stay with and an employer I want to leave behind? The difference is, is that they listen to me. Hi, my name is Caroline Casey and I'm the founder of The Valuable 500. In the BAME episode, we talked about the dangers of blanket terms. Yeah. When you lump yeah. all people of colour together, when the lived experiences are so different. Yeah. The same applies to disability. Whether, Absolutely. Whether it's physical, sensory or cognitive, it's a very different lived experience. And then acquired or congenital. There you go. You've just talked about BAME or the soft bigotry. Look what we're finding out. This conversation about disability is no different, no. right? This is not rocket science. But what I find very interesting to your question about why is the issue of disability so 
on the edges of business is because of the fear of the complexity, mm -hmm. the fear of getting it wrong. And actually, I'll be really honest, they would rather try and deal with things that may be simpler and more straightforward and easy. Because can you imagine what a business has to deal with in trying to get it all right? And I've noticed with, with disability, they say, but what to do? What do we do, Caroline? What do we do? And I'm like, but what did you do when we, you started to have the conversation about the environment? What did you do when you started to have the conversation about gender? Mm. Surely you looked at what's happening in your business. And what's happening elsewhere What did working. your competitors do? Yeah. What did people outside do? Did you go to experts? Did you talk to the cohort of people? Because the most important thing about disability is just ask. Yeah, just ask. I don't know what your lived experience is. You don't know what mine is. But we I can have the conversations. When you look at the employment rates for different types of disability, you realise that looking at averages is very dangerous because mm. actually for some disabilities like hearing, um, the employment rate's well over 60%. Yes. But actually down here we've got uh, things like epilepsy, mental illness, speech Learning impediments. Learning difficulties. Yeah, exactly. And, and those rates are very, very different. So in fact, when you look at the average that we were just looking at, which mm. is just over half, 51%, you mm -hmm. can see there's the disability employment gap that mm -hmm. we were looking at, but look at these people here with these kinds of disabilities, the gap is much Nowhere wider. Nowhere near. They're nowhere, nowhere near. near even the average of people with disabilities in general. Exactly. So so with something like epilepsy, only you know, the, the employment rate is around about 33%. But is, I would have thought there are certain forms of disability, because the thing with this is obviously people are self-identifying. Yeah. There are a lot of people who cover their disabilities. One of the things that uh, Caroline Casey was talking about, this is something she did herself. I would have thought there were a lot of these forms of disabilities that people probably don't actually report. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's one of the weaknesses of a self-reported mm. survey, which is that you're entirely reliant on someone submitting that information. Yeah. And I mean, I think even with physical disabilities, looking at this data, the thing that's really interesting is not one of these categories actually reaches the employment rate no. of, um, of, of people without disability anyway. Yeah. Of course, the other thing that we can talk about with this is that what we're seeing here is our best data that we have on this at mm -hmm. the moment but it's nowhere near like as comprehensive as the data we would get for something like the gender pay yes, gap exactly. where we're asking companies to report yes. this is this is a, a quarterly survey um, do you think that's the sort of thing levels. that needs to happen do you think well, that we need reporting on this obviously there's discussions around reporting on BAME uh, and pay gaps I think there's certainly the same arguments that you could make you know historically until we got the gender reporting and now with the pressure for, for BAME I think you can make exactly the same arguments mm. uh, for uh, for disability partly because what we've been looking at up to now is just the employment rates and yeah. this general pattern that physical disabilities have slightly higher employment rates generally than mental yeah but in fact the um, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission have carried out some analysis of the disability pay gap okay and that takes us much more into this territory we're thinking well where, where do we start talking about a requirement for companies to report talk about the role legislation has to play so very important I'm very interested in some of the stuff that's going on in China in terms of actually mandating large businesses to make sure that a percentage of their workforce is from the disabled community what are your thoughts on that kind of legislation okay so the quota <laughs> question comes up what I'm worried about on the quota systems um, in many of the OECD countries who have these quotas mm. about employment figures, yeah. which are often around 10% yeah. representation in the yeah. employment body. And fines if you don't meet 50 them. 50% of them pay the fines. I know. They write them yeah, into their budgets. To their budget. yes. so, just, uh, so then there's no point having legislation if we are not going to stand over our legislation. Yes. I'm Jana Kakar, the global managing partner of Dalberg. It was wonderful to have your team observe the round table and sort of take away the nuggets and then compile a to-do, an action point for CEOs and HRs. Often there's a real focus on am I recruiting a sufficiently diverse group or um, uh, you know, am I incentivizing them sufficiently. But understanding how diversity drives better team performance and then how to incentivize diversity across the life cycle once you have a diverse set of employees. That's where the trick is. 
you think about what's the value, what's the performance value that we're talking about from diversity and inclusion, it's the diversity of the thought and the decision making and, and the risk aversion group and thing, stopping group thinking. Just on yeah. that, I mean, we, we still have, um, on those dimensions of diversity, pretty poor measurement and metrics. Mm. You know, beyond the identifiable characteristics, and it's good that we're doing a better job of recording those, mm. when it comes to um, personality differences, cognitive differences, yes. we're still at the foothills yeah. there mm. of thinking about how to get a fix on that when yes. building genuinely diverse teams across all its dimensions. Yes. Mm. The composition of the, uh, the, the balance of characters in the team is so exactly. critical. Exactly, and, and, and the notion, as, as um, Helena was saying, of, of you know, genuinely team-based yes. recruitment, performance evaluation and promotion. That's, we're still a world away it's from having it. Ignition is a brewery in South East London. We have a tap room as well, and we sell uh, draft ale and bottled ale. Our secret is that our staff team have learning disabilities, but the beer they make is so good that we're able to sell it and pay them the London living wage of 10.55 an hour. Wow. I mean, we've been looking at the data in relation uh, to people with disabilities in the workplace, and particularly learning disabilities. That group in particular earn the least and are the least likely to be employed. Is that why you decided to focus on that that side of disability? Uh, sort of. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it was 94% of people yes. had um, no job. Yep. Um, they've actually stopped measuring it. So I think the government now has just given up. Because it's so bad. What's the point? You're trying to sell an idea. And I think what we've learned about this is it's about people. People employ people. And also to create the kind of culture where your employees can thrive. Because if you're taking somebody with learning disabilities into an environment that isn't prepared for them, sometimes you can be doing that employee a disservice. So what's wonderful about here is you've created the kind of environment that's inclusive enough for all your employees to thrive. Oh, well, thank you. And, yeah. and I, I think it matters. I think what's good about it is it's actually a lot of the changes that we've made in comparison to places where I've worked before. Mm. Actually, we've got a much healthier culture and I've now gone and employed those in places where I will work, you know, and, and it's a lot of the things we've had to do about, you know, um, being patient or getting a good routine or having a healthy, uh, the way in which you talk to each other being really healthy are actually just things anyone should do. And I think we are an extreme version of what I'd like the world to be mm. because our team is obviously um, very special. Mm. Um, but I think the impact that someone can have with a learning disability for the better in your business is really good because it's great for morale. It's also great for sort of, I think, getting people just to behave better mm. and think, actually, I'm at work yeah. and I need to show a good example and I need to be a better person. You're an economist by trade. Yes. <laughs> we won't hold that against you. <laughs> but do you think that also influenced your decision to actually do something about this pro problem, knowing how many people are out of work and how much we're losing out on as an economy as a result of that? Yeah, so it was a kind of it's a financial gamble in a way. Mm -hmm. I thought, right, the best way to show that, you know, our guys can generate you profit and income is it's set up a company. Yeah. yeah. And so we've taken people with no, I have no brewing experience, they have no brewing experience. I'm not mad about beer, I quite like our beer. Um, <laughs> and actually we've created a, a business that is surplus making and, you know, is a good employer based on their talents. For anybody wanting to replicate your model, for corporations who want to look at doing something like this on a larger scale, what are the pitfalls? What are the difficulties? Because you know, let's be frank about that too. So I think it's a big cultural change, and we all we all know cultural change is the hardest. Yeah, it's really difficult, and there needs to be buy-in at the top. Is the first thing. So the, you know, the top honcho they need to say. I'm really committed to this and we're going to make it happen. And without that, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. And then I think there's been a lot of the kind of um, systematization of employment for people with disabilities. So, you know, there's got there's a checklist and they make them interview ready. Then there's a yes. CV ready thing. And we, we've just largely discarded that. You did? Too. Yes, you we have. So, so you yes. got rid of that whole process? So what we've done is we've started very much with the people and said, do you want to work with us? Are you really keen? Yeah. And then they'll say, yes. Say, OK, we'll come and just do a shift because actually that's the best way for us to learn. Because even if they can't do any of it, that's fine. You can, but you can tell if the aptitude is there. Mm. And if they sort of go, okay, because pulling a pint is actually really, well, I find it really hard. <laughs> and, uh, so it is, I've never done really it. It's really difficult because it, it comes at the head's too big, it's too small, it's yeah. too fat, it's too cold. But you can tell if someone's gonna keep on going till they get it. And then once they get it, it's- They've got it. If you want to truly 
I suppose, maximize the performance potential of your diverse teams. You bring them on board, and then you identify where are their sort of hidden constraints to top performance? Where are there ways in which diversity, which we know has been statistically proven, uh, to be a key driver of financial performance. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was shocking to me to see uh, that it was so, so well quantified that literally it's a percentage to two of, of, <laughs> of uh, increased financial performance if you have a diverse yeah. team. And you can just see the, you know, the, the needle go up and down. But, but yet there's still resistance. There it is. makes no sense. I know. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's you sort of, we, f we spend uh, enough time, I think, on the diagnosis, right? Mm. Or the demonstration of the business case. Okay. But then Not committing the and executing the action is a different That's what the next step is. Yeah. Okay. So we have workforce. Let's talk about customers and consumers mm. in terms of what a CEO or leader within an organization can do to add value in relation mm. to diversity for the customers. The interesting thing about customers and consumers is. It, it is, it is a, only a medium known fact, the mm -hmm. degree to which the diverse consumer is growing in strength, buying power strength, decision making power oh. strength. I found it fascinating, one, one of your um, attendees at the CEO roundtable, Karen Blackett, CEO, powerful CEO in her own right, and, and she said, look, you know, over the last decade we have seen minority buying power go from 30 odd billion to 300 billion yes. pounds. So let's just Let's pause and think yeah, about that. Yeah. So shifting gears to say, well, who is this diverse customer that I have out there? Yeah. And that understanding, I'm not servicing properly. Exactly. Yeah. And understanding how do I actually tailor myself, my product, my solution, my approach in order to capture them. The most provocative way to get anybody mm. in business interested is to look at their bottom line. Yeah. So let's just talk about the UK. Okay. You're worth 249 billion. That is what this disability community is worth. Mm. There's massive competition going on those high streets. Why are you not listening? I think it's a really interesting when we see that supermarkets, you know, supplying for the 400,000 vegans. Yeah. Because they see it as value, right? <laughs> but, okay. But, but let, let's be honest, because they see it as value. Well, what about 20% of the population? What about 20% of the population here? So I think Barclays have always made the intention very clear. They want to be the most accessible and inclusive FTSE company. Mm. And they do that through their consumer offering. Mm. But the best example of all time for any of this is Apple. Really? Why? How so? Because Steve Jobs, we know, was probably very difficult, but he mm. was a visionary. And mm. he wanted to create the most beautiful products that everybody else in the world could use. Mm. That's called universal design. Mm. Apple was the very first brand in the world to reach one trillion. Mm. Why do you think that is? It's because there are more of us who can use their products. Mm. Actually, Apple is a brand that most of the disabled community will choose. So was that a consideration when they were designing? No, he just wow, wanted to have hardware. beautiful I had no idea. For everyone. Now, they don't shout about being an inclusive or an accessible company. They it's did universal it. design. Sometimes we forget that if we get design right for the full spectrum of disability, yeah. we'll probably get it right for all of us. I kind of think the business case to incentivize business, let me just tell you, it's an eight trillion market. Mm. It's a brand opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's an uncluttered space. It's the acquisition retention of talent. It's about innovation and productivity. Next generation really care about spending money and working with companies that allow you to be who you are. Why have we not seen accelerated change? I'll go back to where we began because the most powerful force in this planet is making a decision to leave the disability community as an invisible market. Mm. And unless it gets into this game, meaningfully invest in it, we will continue to see no matter, what, no matter what legislation you do in the world, because let's be honest, money runs the world. Mm. Power, money, business, it affects politics. And I don't think any legislation will be able to solve this if business don't take responsibility, but, and take up the opportunity. I believe diversity has a triple line benefit to business for innovation, productivity, and bottom line. It's a triple line belt to the individual, to society and peace at large, and to the business bottom line. I mean, what is not to like? Mm.